So I realized that I forgot to put in a slide that says who I am, so I'll just briefly say, hi, I'm Shauna. Um, I am a organizer, writer, programmer, uh, teacher, a researcher, and I work primarily in the area of open source software, open science, uh, and open government. Basically, if it has the word open before it, I like it. Um, and we're gonna be talking today uh, about uh, how to talk. Um, specifically, we're gonna be going over uh, specific conversational behaviors that can cause problems in how we have discussions. Um, and they can be quite frustrating, and they frustrate me because they prevent us from having good, honest, productive discussions. The kind where everyone who is participating feels as though they've gotten something out of it, um, or at least as though they've been respected and they've had a chance to have their voice heard. Um, so before we start, I want to talk about a myth. Um, and this myth, you, you may not believe it yourself, but I've heard it uh, implied and articulated before. And this myth is the idea that arguing is the road to truth. And that if we just talk enough, if we are unemotional enough, and if we're abstract enough, <laughs> we will somehow, in this great marketplace of ideas, find the right answer. Uh, I don't believe that. <laughs> and I, I dislike this myth because I think it allows us to be lazy and therefore hurtful in the way we have our conversations. Um, and so, uh, what I want to do is talk about some of the work we can do. And it is work. It's interpersonal labor. Uh, some of the work we can do to make better conversations. One of the main things I want to give you in this talk uh, is some stock phrases. I love stock phrases uh, because I'm not very good at improvisation. I have tried my best to memorize this talk. I'm not improvising it. Um, and so lots of times I'll let crappy situations continue because I don't know what to say. Uh, so I believe in embracing uh, l'esprit de la scalière, the staircase wit, and using what you wish you'd said next time. Uh, so I'm going to share some stock phrases, and if you come up with any of your own that you think others could use, feel free to jot them down and share them at the end of the talk. I do have a couple of other tools and strategies as well, um, and I hope that we can all benefit from them, uh, because in some cases, in some cases, we're the person where we're trying to minimize the harm we're doing to others, and in some cases, we're trying to minimize the harm that others are doing to us. So I think I'm trying to address it from both that perspective. How can I prevent myself from causing problems, and how can I deal with it when others are causing problems for me? Uh, so with that said, let's get started. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is interruptions. It might feel silly to define interruptions, but there's actually several different kinds, so I think it's worth parsing them through. Uh, the first kind is classic interruptions, and that's what you'd expect. It's when one person's talking and someone else starts talking and continues talking and basically shuts the other person off. Uh, the next type of interruptions is an interjection. It's very similar, except the person who's interrupting only talks for, let's say, a few seconds. And this can sometimes be to ask a clarifying question or to indicate agreement or disagreement. And it can be useful or even necessary, uh, but it can also be dominating or aggressive, and it depends on the context. A third type of interruption is pause interruptions, and that's when someone starts speaking into the pause in between someone's sentences or thoughts. And this can be very ambiguous, because it can be hard to know whether the person's actually done speaking and therefore whether it's an interruption at all. There's actually been some really interesting research done by a woman named uh, Dr. Deborah Tannen, uh, who's a professor of linguistics. And uh, she's looked at how cultural differences, gender socialization, and personality differences influence the space that people leave in between uh, in between their thoughts and sentences. Also, she's looked at a bunch of other things, but this is the, the part that's relevant to the talk. Uh, and so I have a quote from her that kind of gets at that. If two people who are talking have even slightly different expectations about how long to wait between turns, then the person who expects a slightly shorter pause will take a turn first, filling and then curtailing the pause that the other person's waiting for. I had a British friend who, thought I, never, who I thought had never had anything to say until I learned she was waiting for her turn. A fourth kind of interruption is an overlap, when two people begin speaking at once. Now, you may quibble with me calling this an interruption, but uh, there, there's an importance in who chooses to continue speaking when people overlap. And I'd point out that uh, overlap and pause interruptions, although people might not think of them as interruptions, have the same overall effect of allowing one person to keep speaking while silencing another. Um, so interruptions are really, really common. Uh, they happen all the time, 
most of us have uh, interrupted someone, and most of us have been interrupted, and some of us even makes jokes about interruption. <laughs> if anybody doesn't know this joke, please ask me afterwards, and I will be gleeful to tell it to you. <laughs> uh, so, so how can you tell when you're interrupting? It can actually be really hard to observe this in yourself because it's happened so commonly and it's un it can be unconscious. So one trick is to ask a good friend to observe you when not tell you that they're observing you because that'll change things. Um, and keep a record of how often are you interrupting, how often are you being interrupted, and give you that feedback. Um, as is implied by that strategy, it is easier to tell when other people are interrupting if you're focusing on it. In fact, um, someone at Slate, someone uh, Slate published this summer, someone had done an uh, informal research study on their own office and had uh, recorded all of the interruptions and the gender. Um, they had assigned the gender of male or female. Uh, to, uh, to the people in their office and uh, recorded who was interrupting um, who. And they found essentially that men were more likely to interrupt women and also that women were more likely to be interrupted even by other women. Um, and so in this particular case, we see that women are more likely to have the negative effects of interruptions uh, apply to them. Um, and I have not seen any research that looks at this on along other uh, spectrums of oppression. Um, I, if anyone else knows of them, I'd love to hear about them. So, uh, so where you can, something that you can get from this is that interruptions themselves are not necessarily this inherent terrible thing, but, uh, let me take a step back, but uh, it's the patterns uh, of interruptions that become a problem when specific people or specific groups of people are more likely to be silenced. Um, and so strategies to deal with this can include, wrong direction. Uh, so the inimitable Melchua uh, once uh, observed a colleague of, myself, a colleague of mine and myself uh, interacting, teaching, and uh, pointed out that my colleague was very frequently interrupting me. Specifically, he was doing pause interruptions where I would take a second to gather my thoughts and he'd start speaking. And she tasked him with this exercise. She called it the five second rule. Which is he had to wait five seconds uh, through any silence before he could speak. Um, whether we were having a one-on-one -on -one conversation, whether we were teaching together in a group conversation, if there was a silence, you should wait five seconds before speaking. And this was really effective at allowing me to speak. It was also really hard work, and I know this because I've used this myself when I've been in a situation where I feel like I'm interrupting other people too much. I mean, that does happen when I get really excited about things or when I'm talking to people that are shy or in a situation where I have more privilege and that's acting to quiet the other person. Uh, if you are not successful at presenting interruptions and interruptions occur, there are some things you can say. For instance, uh, excuse me, uh, Sam didn't seem like she'd finished her thought, or Sam, were you done talking? I couldn't quite tell. Or hold on a sec, I'm not quite finished. If you notice a pattern of interruptions, you can say, I noticed you cut me off a few times, can you please let me finish? And those are relatively non-conflicty ways to, to point out the problem and continue. Uh, now, even though those are what should in an ideal world be non-conflict, you know, really acceptable things to say, there can be a lot of pushback towards people, especially if you're already underprivileged. It can be seen as complaining or uh, causing a scene if you object to being interrupted. And so one way to get around this, if you have a recurring problem, for instance, in a workplace, uh, is to find an ally or a buddy and make a pact to point out when either of you is being interrupted. So if your buddy gets interrupted, you say, oh, I think you interrupted so-and-so. And if your buddy notices you being interrupted, they do the same for you. Uh, finally, if you have a more formal conversation, um, you can do something that's called taking stack. So uh, I have a story behind this one. Last year, I was at an unconference, um, and I was asked at the last minute to help moderate a woman in technology session. So I joined this session, and to my dismay, despite the fact that it was called uh, women in technology, and you would think would therefore center the experiences and voices of women, it was almost all men talking, and worse, uh, when women tried to talk, men were interrupting them. So I stepped in and I instituted Stack. Um, and Stack is when you have one person, a moderator, who, uh, as people have things to say, they contact either through raising their hand or eye contact the moderator who writes them down and then calls on them in that order. 
Uh, it's a first in, first out system. And uh, despite the fact that I'd instituted this, people were still interrupting. Men were still mostly interrupting women. Uh, but this structure empowered me to step in and stop them and say, we're going in a specific order here. It's worth noting that there's another system of doing stack called progressive stack. And in progressive stack, um, you take a person or group of people whose voices you want to empower, and you have them go higher in the queue, either directly to the top or faster than someone from a more dominant group. Uh, so, uh, uh, moving on. Uh, derailing. So derailing is a term, uh, what I would say is probably a negative connotation uh, for manipulating a topic of conversation. So when someone's derailing, they're doing that in maybe in a bad faith way. Um, but it's important to note that manipulating a topic of conversation is actually having a conversation. Like that's a part of speaking. Um, and that every conversation has multiple paths that it can go down. And so I've attempted to uh, demonstrate this with this flowchart I made. Um, so imagine that you're at a conference and you're sitting next to someone and they say, you know, I really wish they offered childcare at this event. There's a lot of different ways that you can respond, some of which are stunningly unhelpful and will shut the conversation right down. Um, and then, but there are also answers that um, are not that bad on their face, but might lead to different results. And you know, you can't know ahead of time exactly how what you say will pan out because there's just so many different versions and free will and things. Uh, but you can make choices that are more likely to engender a better conversation, um, specifically both in the words you choose, um, which I'm not so much focusing on right now, but in the, the amount of control that you give to the other person. Um, and I like to think of this as a multiverse, and each time you say something, you spawn off a new alternate universe, and then there's the alternate universes where you said something different. Um, and I think it's important to make good choices because you don't want to end up in the darkest timeline. <laughs> right, so as with interruptions, uh, how you're controlling the topic of conversation is not something you want to have to worry about all the time, because there's so many conversations you aren't having that if you were worried over all of them, then you'd just be overwhelmed. Um, where I think it's important to focus on this is when you're having important conversations. So if a friend is talking about being harassed, or if you're having a discussion in your workplace about a recurring problem, any time where you want to make sure that people's voices aren't being silenced, you can pay attention to these things. Um, oh, I don't think I met strategies yet. Oh, right. So another, another instance where um, another way in which these patterns, uh, with, another way in which this is a problem is when you have patterns. Um, again, as with interruptions, um, because some people might be socialized to. Uh, not take control of the conversation when someone else uh, is doing that. So some people might be very comfortable directing a conversation back when they didn't feel as though their point was heard or they hadn't found out the information they wanted. Where, whereas someone else might feel socialized or compelled to answer every question that they're being asked. Um, and then uh, another way to think about this is uh, the sort of the number of times someone has a conversation. So this is a problem uh, for a lot of minority groups because Minorities frequently, there's less of them than uh, people in the majority. And so uh, something that's a new conversation for a member of the majority group might be the third time that someone's had that conversation this week. And you know, sometimes you get tired of having conversation. Um, and I think this is often the f some of the force behind the phrase, educate yourself, um, frequently but not always. Uh, I think you can translate that as, I don't want to have this conversation right now. I've had this conversation a ton. Uh, and I have a right to not have this conversation with you. Find someone else to have this conversation with, maybe with a book or a blog or something. Uh, so uh, I think that kind of ties in. So strategies for, for taking control or giving up control of conversations. So if you're worried about dominating a conversation, one of the best ways to stop doing that is to not speak. Um, and if you're a talkative person like myself, this can seem like a really sad option, but actually some of the best conversations I've been a part of have been conversations where I wasn't speaking or I was speaking very little. If you do decide to participate in conversations when you're worried about this, there's some key phrases that you can use. Uh, so for instance, if you notice yourself uh, overly controlling or dragging a, a different, to a different topic, you can use phrases like, that's a bit off topic, uh, feel free to disregard it, or uh, please continue with what you were saying. Um, if you do want to try and control the conversation, or you want to direct in a specific 
uh, direction, use phrasing that indicates that you know that it's a request you're making and you don't ha the conversation doesn't have to go that way. Such as, if you don't mind, I'd like to talk about. Um, use open-ended questions, um, which allow people to decide how they want to respond, such as, what do you think? Um, and if you notice it's still a problem, you can say, I feel like I've been dominating the conversation. I'm sorry, I'll take a step back. Uh, so when you notice other people doing this to you, what can you say? Uh, so I have a couple stories about this. Um, one time recently I was at a conference um, and I was talking to some women. We were actually talking about a code of conduct violation at the conference. Um, and a man joined us and said, you know, I'm so tired of hearing about the problems with women in technology. I want to talk about solutions. Um, and as I said, I'm bad at improvising, so I didn't actually say anything right away. But after I had a chance to collect myself, I said, you know, you're new to the conversation. You're just one person among many. And you're a man when we're talking about women in technology. What gives you the right to decide what we're talking about? Um, uh, in another situation, I, had, I was talking with a friend who was describing an experience of harassment. And someone else was asking just a lot of questions, until eventually they said, you know, I don't want to answer any more questions. Um, I'll share what I want to share. I'm feeling pressured by you. Please back off. So these, this can feel very direct. Um, and they're also unambiguous situations. So in more ambiguous situations, situations or where you don't feel comfortable being as direct, uh, you can simply try to redirect the conversation without calling out the behavior that's uh, behind it. So I'd like to get back to what Sam was saying before. Or that's interesting, but maybe part of a different conversation. Or as I was saying earlier, uh, so I want to take a moment, uh, as we're at the end of this talk, to share a hypothesis I have on which I've done no research and have zero proof. <laughs> but it's interesting to me that Tumblr and Twitter are known as the hotbeds of social justice online, uh, when they're also the least linear form of social media. On a Facebook post or an email thread or a forum, uh, you generally have one long conversation in which you're frequently push to engage with everyone who comes along. Whereas on something like Tumblr or Twitter, you have that splintering of conversations, allowing users to respond to the parts they want to respond to and ignore the parts that they want to ignore, and also separate out the, uh, the discussion. So I think that these forms, the format of these and structure of these mediums uh, sort of empower people to go to have more ability to traverse that forking path of conversations uh, than other forms of media do. Uh, there's so much research and work that's been done on these topics that I couldn't begin to cover it in a short talk like this. So I've linked some, not all, uh, resources that I recommend continuing on with. Um, and uh, one last thought as I end. So you might have listened to this talk and thought, wow, uh, you, you recommend a lot of observing and thinking and practicing. Uh, you, you even suggested that I like do a little research study on myself. Uh, that's a lot of work. Um, and yes, it is work. It is, it is hard. It is difficult. Um, I would point out that uh, marginalized and oppressed groups have to do this work to have conversations all the time. Queer people frequently have to worry about pronoun usage and how to refer to their significant others. Uh, women have to worry about whether they're being perceived as flighty or flirty or hysterical or bitchy when they, uh, when they speak. And people from non-dominant cultures have to change the way they speak and the way they act with their, uh, whether they're at work, at home, at school, or with friends. So a lot of people are already doing a lot of hard work in order to make conversations easier and better. And I think the least we can do is do some of that work ourselves. Um, and I also think that we can also keep working on coming up with best practices and doing research. Um, so that's, that's my alternative equation. Uh, and the question marks indicate all the different things that I imagine influence it. Cool. So here are some references and credits. Uh, and if anyone has suggestions for phrases or just general questions, I believe I still have some minutes left. <laughs>